Father Leo, let me ask, are you going to be obedient and bless same-sex couples? Will you give communion to people who openly living in mortal sin? So I am not going to bless same-sex couples. The fact is you can't bless sin. You just, you just technically can't. But you can bless people even if they are in the midst of sin. Welcome to the Father Leo Show, where I'm dishing out faith, culture, and commentary. And in this episode, we're going to actually respond to some of the comments that people left regarding my episode about obedience to God, or to the bishop, or to a pope, especially to a pope that might not be as popular with people who consider themselves faithful Catholics. And so we're going to jump right into it. But before we do, if you haven't done so yet, make sure you click subscribe, like, share your comments, because clearly I'm reviewing them. And make sure you let family and friends know, because I'm trying to create a conversation, not to pick sides, but to hopefully provide what the church actually teaches and how to actually apply it. And in this case, talking about obedience. And the only way you can do it is with your support. So make sure you Click that like button, share, subscribe, and support us on Patreon. So let's just jump right into it with my comments regarding the ongoing debate about whether or not I'm wrong because I'm siding with the Pope and not siding with a very holy priest who is simply doing what God told him to do. Here's my comments about faith. I want you all to know that I do not take these revelations lightly and that I don't overlook your comments because what I find is that there are very good people who vehemently disagree with me and that's okay because as some of you are going to hear in your comments you think that I'm leading you away from God because I don't agree with the actions of Father Foster. I'm also not throwing him underneath the bus because I don't know the man. And what I can tell is that he is a very holy man, someone who I'd probably go to spiritual direction to, and I would heed his counsel because he clearly loves the Lord Jesus, the Blessed Mother, and he clearly loves souls. And I also believe that he loves the Catholic faith, which is why he wants to preserve it. The question has nothing to do with whether or not I'm supporting him or the Pope. The question that I'm trying to pose is, do we understand what obedience means in the Catholic tradition? And do we understand that there is a process and a criteria to determine whether or not a private revelation can be promoted as authentic? I think there's just too many emotions and it's going to be clear with how I'm going to kind of respond to some of these questions. So please know, I am not attacking anyone who goes to Mission Divine Mercy. As you know, Archbishop Sillars has said, he enjoyed visiting the Mission Divine Mercy and he felt that it was a very beautiful and spiritual place for people to connect with God. His prohibition was on the promotion of this private revelation as something that was approved by the Catholic Church because it was not approved by the Catholic Church in part because perhaps the process wasn't initiated fully to really investigate it so that they can get a, a, a basically an imprimatur, a stamp of approval. So I'm not attacking any person, but I'm trying to defend the priesthood and the priesthood requires obedience, poverty, chastity. That's what's at stake. If I take obedience away, but I do practice poverty and chastity, what kind of priest would I be? Honestly, what kind of priest would I be? So if we remove obedience in terms of what the Catholic Church teaches, then, then we're really kind of creating sects, S-E-C-T-S, -E sects of the Catholic Church, or another Protestant Reformation, which I have seen happen. Secondly, even in just the materials that I have kind of do dove into, it's, it's very interesting that these are not considered 
authentic messages, but a prophetic message, a prophetic message. And so if we actually understand what the role of a prophet is, they're not supposed to foretell the future. They're simply supposed to tell us if we're headed in a certain direction, we will eventually end up there. And guess what? As far as a prophetic message is concerned, I agree with like 99% of what I saw from the Mission Divine Mercy private revelation as a prophetic message. If we don't clean our act up as a Catholic Church, we are going to suffer. But please know Paul VI has already kind of said that. He, he said very clearly in 1972, Satan's smoke has made its way into the temple of God through some crack. In other words, we already know that Satan has allowed confusion to reign in the Catholic Church because we are not vigilant. But can I tell you something? Jesus already told us this. Technically, we don't need to believe in any private revelation. I'm repeating it again. We don't need to believe in any private revelation. Jesus himself already told this to us. And how fitting that on the eve of our Triduum celebrations, we're going to be reminded that Jesus himself was handed over by sinners. And, you know, in part, it's because there were people who were, in a way, disobedient to him. He told them, don't tell people about your healing. And they did it. And look at what happened. The wildfires spread and gossip reigned. And in this kind of gossiping and backbiting, the lack of true transparency would eventually lead to Jesus's suffering and death. But Fear not, and I tell this to people of Mission Divine Mercy, be not afraid. If you are faithful to Christ, and I believe that you are, and if the Mission Divine Mercy priests are faithful to Christ and his church, which, because you can't separate the two, and it's very sad that, yeah, there are imperfect people in Christ's church, but if they are faithful, I guarantee you, good things are going to happen. And we have to work on unity. And so when it comes to, once again, the idea of faith and obedience, it has nothing to do whether or not you like this Pope or not. It has everything to do with the fact that as a priest, we vowed obedience. And we put our hands in the bishop's hands. And we promised with our life that we, obe that we would be obedient to him and his successors. Now, we might not like what the bishop has to say or like what the bishop tells me to do, but if I don't obey him, then I can truly be a rogue priest. And we know, and I'm, again, I'm not calling Father Foch that. He seems like an incredible man, but it could create a mentality of rogueness. So I just simply ask you, if there was, say, a liberal mission divine mercy now there would never be a version of that necessarily but if there was a, a mission divine mercy that had a message that said everything that pope francis is doing is is true and authentic and the people that were part of that they were very faithful and that they lived a holy life would would we be forced to agree with it i sometimes think that we might be tempted to pick and choose what we say is from God. That's not faith. That is being a cafeteria Catholic. And unfortunately, people are being obedient to what they want to hear. And so I don't do this show in order to become popular. I'm glad that people watch the show. But I do this to try to encourage people to a deeper understanding of what the Catholic Church means when they talk about obedience and that there is a process for evaluating whether or not a prophecy is considered divine revelation worthy of the Catholic Church's permission to promote it as authentic and approved private revelation. And to remind Catholics again 
that I don't have to believe in a private revelation and I can still be a good Catholic as long as I don't kind of make fun of it, I don't diminish it, I don't see its importance. Because I know that there are some people who call themselves Catholic and they look at Fatima, they look at Lourdes, they look at Nikita and they're like, ah, oh, that's just so silly. I'm not that guy. Remember, I study Mariology and I have to study what it, what's required in order to proclaim a Marian apparition as authentic. And I will end my comments on faith about this. We got to be careful. We must be very careful. In the kind of situation in life that we're living in right now, it's going to be easy to want to jump into a message that affirms our faith. But we have to be careful because private revelation isn't necessary. The divine revelation of the scriptures already is enough for us. We don't need anything else. And Jesus has already told us, Jesus already told us clear and well that our faith will be tested, that there will be false shepherds, that there will be trials and tribulation, and that Jesus is going to come and judge us. We already know that. Technically, we don't need to hear it again. But if these are authentic messages and they are approved by the Catholic Church, then these messages can help encourage us to live a more devout life. So let's jump into it now with my commentary about the culture of these comments. So I'm going to kind of review some of these comments. Some of them, many of them, kind of repeated the same thing and basically told me I'm a terrible priest. <laughs> and I mean, I'm not a perfect priest by any means, but I don't think I'm a terrible priest. I'm trying to help people to understand what the church teaches, whether you like it or not. I'm just letting you know what the church teaches. And so Fiat Voluntas Tua 22 says, Father Leo, let me ask, are you going to be obedient and bless same-sex couples? Will you give communion to people who openly living in mortal sin? So I am not going to bless same-sex couples. Uh, and I know we're talking about fiducia supplicans. And by the way, we're going to have a follow-up. We're going to have a follow-up episode on that as well. And uh, the fact is, you can't bless sin. You just, you just technically can't. But you can bless people even if they are in the midst of sin. And I've given this example. If I see a guy shooting up or if I see a man hurting his wife, first of all, I'm going to try to stop it. But if I can't stop it, can I at least pray for them and ask God's mercy on them? Yes. Will I give communion to people openly living in mortal sin? No. But at the same time, how will I know unless they go to confession to me, or at least it's announced that they have gone to confession and they are repentant of their sins? And so what this is, is a type of an argument that is kind of missing the point. I'm saying be obedient to the Catholic Church. Pope Francis never forced anyone to bless anybody. He said as a pastoral tool, and again, I think Fiducia Supplicans in spirit tries to be pastoral. In the letter of the law, there are problems. There are no definite qualms about that. There are problems in what was said and how was said. But the spirit is, how do we minister to people who are gay? That, that was the spirit of it. And if people want to live a very black and white approach to life, then I can't do anything about it. You're just going to be angry all the time, and I don't want you to be. Uh, Jane Thizer, 1991, writes, You are as guilty as the archbishop in attacking this holy priest. Shame on you. And I got a lot of people saying, shame on you. Well, first of all, you saying that there is shame on me doesn't make me a shameful priest. Not at all. So these ad hominem attacks, I'm okay with it because I get it. This is a very personal, this is a very personal uh, um controversy to many people. But again, I did not attack this priest. Not at all. In fact, I, I respect him greatly. I just disagree with how he's handled this in the regards that, that there was an obedience placed on him, and he did promise that. And remember that there is a process. 
for this revelation. And, and, and I was doing research. I actually couldn't find out how long these messages were occurring. But I can tell you that the Catholic Church always does things slowly and methodically. You might not like it, but it took years before Trez of, uh, Trez, excuse me, um, uh, Bernadette of Subaru would be proclaimed a saint and that her revelations would be seen as truthful. So things take time in the Catholic Church. Uh, Paul Nguyen, 8104, writes, Father Leah, I watched your whole clip. However, I get nothing out of it but more confusion. Lastly, in the end, you say, listen to your shepherd. That is, the mean, the, is that mean, does that mean, sorry, I'm just reading what they wrote. So clearly there is typos here. I'm not blaming you. I'm just simply saying, as I'm trying to read it directly, it doesn't always make sense, uh, which is very important because what someone writes about divine revelation is always going to be caught up in human language. And as we're reading here, human language can get it wrong. So it says, you say, listen to your shepherd. Does that mean the church should bless homosexuals uh, as commanded by Francis? Francis never commanded that. So your premise of your question is incorrect. Uh, Arturio Rico, 4164. In my humble opinion, Father, how can a bishop ruled these messages not coming from God so quickly without an extensive investigation? Now we're the messages intended by God to be published or to leave it to the discretion of the ordinary bishop, I do see an obedience red line crossed if the bishop says do not publish. So, Arturo, that's exactly it. From what I gather, and again, I know that there are three sides to the story, his, his, and the truth is in the middle somewhere. The bishop asked not to publish these prophecies as authentic revelations that the church says, gave an imprimatur on and said, yep, these are officially church teachings. Asked him not to do it. And as such, an investigation actually couldn't really occur because please know that in order for a private revelation to even be investigated, there needs to be a process before the investigation happens. And I don't think that that process even happened. I think that there was pastoral conversation between the bishop and the priest, and he said, hey, you can't put these out because they're, they're not authentically, they are not authentic to us yet. I don't know if they had done any studies. And from what I gather, because I tried to review as many of the messages as possible, and I'll be honest with you, it is not easy to figure out what is teachings about the prophecy or the prophetic messages themselves. And that's me actually trying to read everything word for word. It, it wasn't clear to me as someone who studied Mariology again, and part of our coursework was learning what is the process in order to proclaim a Marian apparition as authentic. So there was a lack of clarity in just even what was the actual message in what was interpreted to be the message or what was the teaching that people wanted to offer about the message. There was just a lot of confusion and even me trying to understand it myself. dgbt one wo writes, sorry, Father, but there's so much of your explanation that has been left out, even the military and in law enforcement. You can and should disobey an order of your superior if it is against the law or your own oath. I believe this may be one of those instances. I completely disagree with you because the bishop isn't telling people to not pray, to not experience conversion. The bishop did not say commit sins. No, the bishop asked once again, do not publish these and make it seem as if it's authentic revelation that is approved by the Catholic Church. That's kind of where we are with it all. And um, I don't think that I don't think that publishing this against the bishop's orders helped their cause. Again, I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. Just saying that 
It takes time to evaluate the fruits of the Spirit. And humility and obedience is kind of part of proving a revelation is true. Now again, the sense of urgency is what people are coming up to me and saying, there's no time to tell them these things. And I would agree that we don't know the hour or the day when God is going to come. So read the Bible. Jesus is very clear in saying he's going to come to judge the earth. And he's going to judge all of our hearts. Yes, these private revelations, for the most part, do not disagree with the scriptures. There are challenging things that point the finger and accuse certain people of being of the devil. That is a sticking point because, you know, the last time I checked, the Holy Father was elected by his College of Cardinals. You might not like him, and believe me, it is clear that many of you don't, and you do see him as the Antichrist. But can I tell you, people thought the same thing about John Paul II. They said the same thing about Pope Benedict. So if we approach life with, I think that that bishop or that pope or that priest is of the devil, trust me, we're not doing God's will. We're doing more damage to the body of Christ. It is very challenging to see good Catholics so quickly demonize simply because of politics. So let's just call it out. Some of these comments that I saw were truly motivated by politics. One, for example, said, uh, Rachel Richard, well, do I have to go to confession for not taking the COVID vaccine? No, the Pope did tell us to do the right thing for the greater good. Well, I did not go because I wanted, I, well, I did not go, not because I wanted to be disobedient, but like, but I did, like you said, I used discernment. So. There's a lot of kind of illogical things happening here. The Pope never told you you, believe me, I know that the Pope was big on the vaccines. I personally wasn't at all, in fact. In fact, I still am. Maybe I'll have another episode about that. If you want me to do an episode about what I think about the vaccines, I can tell you. I, I'm probably going to at some point. Not, but believe me, that'll definitely make people mad for sure. But I don't do this to make people mad. I want to talk about what is the Catholic Church's teachings about vaccines. And the Pope never proclaimed infallibly, you must take the vaccine or you are not a good person. Huh. He never said that. He just wanted people to be attentive to others. And I'm not making excuses for the man, but I do think, I do think that sometimes the Holy Father hears it from his collaborators and we might not agree with each other. <laughs> we, we probably wouldn't. There would probably be a lot of disagreement. But ultimately, he's the Pope. And so I've got to quote unquote obey him when it comes to matters of faith and morals. Not the vaccine. All right, here's another question or comment from Elizabeth Sack. She writes, Father Leo, I cannot believe that you feel that being obedient to the Pope trumps being obedient to God. It's obvious that you didn't read all the messages or really look into MDM. Father John Mary is being obedient to God. This is kind of the same reactions that I get from people who want to support Father, uh, Father Foster. And God bless him. I, I actually would love to have a conversation with him. I want to reach out to his office and see if he'd be willing to do an interview with me. So if any of you have contact with him, I would love to hear his experiences. So please send me that information and let him know that I'm not here to judge him, but I just want to hear from him. Because in the letter that Archbishop Sillars wrote, Gustavo, he, he mentioned um, that the messages caused confusion and chaos amongst the faithful. And I know that that wasn't Father Foster's intent. Clearly it's not. If anything, it's to scare the heaven into people and hopefully scare the hell out of people. But whether he knew it or not, it did cause 
confusion, and chaos, and to some degree, a lot of fear. And that's why the diocese has to almost exercise damage control because some people might not even know Father John Foster. Um, and, and I think that Father John Mary. And so I think that when you put something out there, it can cause a reaction. And I think the diocese has a responsibility to respond to it. And that's why it was told, please don't promote any more of these messages as authentic private revelations, because it will create confusion. And a lot of people see me as a faithful priest, and I'm grateful, but in this case, they now almost really dislike me because I don't agree with them. So I get a lot of this personal shaming that if I don't agree with you, I'm a terrible person. Well, guess what? The, the same can be done flip side. If you don't agree with me, you're a terrible person and a bad Catholic. This kind of passive aggressive name calling doesn't help the conversation. We need to have conversations that lead to conversion. That means turning towards each other and actually listening to them. And what I'm hearing from comments like this is, I'm a terrible priest because I disagree with Father John Mary, who they think is being obedient to God, which is more important than being obedient to a bishop that they might not like. That's kind of what I'm hearing. And it's kind of a, a little bit of a circular, flat, fallacious, um, uh, kind of way of of thinking. It's it's not 100% logical. Uh, Kefa Rocks wants to tell me, good morning, Father. It is time for a little charitable correction. Fine. Happy to take charitable correction. Your primary concern as a priest is salvation of souls. Correct. Not necessarily bringing us news of what people may or may not have thought, done, or said. Bring your flock the sacraments. Okay. Counsel individuals and or married couples in practicing the faith. Okay. A paying YouTube channel is probably not the route we need for our holy priests. Okay. Actually, our YouTube channel is free. If you want to support the work that we do, because guess what? It takes money to actually get our, our team together to, to do the research, to edit. It takes time and energy to put a show together. The scriptures also say, you know, a, a laborer is worth his or her wage. So this paid YouTube channel business, it's kind of interesting because I don't get paid for it. <laughs> this goes to our team. But here's what I'd like to do now. I'd, I'd like to kind of um, share with you the, a, 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 a voicemail that I received because I'm grateful for this person. And here's how I'm going to close. I'm going to make my commentary because this person really encapsulated what a lot of these comments were about. So here's my commentary on other people's commentary. So I got a voicemail from this person and I just kind of want to play it for you. Hi, I was just watching the Father Leo show on YouTube where he talks about the obedience in the church. I have a big problem with him when he was discussing the divine mission uh, statements that were put out um, by Father Foster and from the divine uh, mercy mission in San Antonio. Well, I, I just have one thing to say. Um, for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear, and I have a feeling Father Leo needs to sit in silence and really listen to the Lord um, because that's where we get what the Lord wants us to know. And the confusion, distractions, the things that are not of God and everything that Father Foster has said um, is all toward God and what God wants from us. So um, I would say, Father Leo, instead of doing food trucks and, you know, all his busy schedule, he needs to stop and really pray and sit in silence because his message um, I don't agree with. And I'm sure other people 
who are very much aware of what is going on right now and are aware of the second coming uh, really realize that this is serious stuff and not for him to put a video out and say whatever, whatever you want to believe, whatever. Okay, well, that's, that's all the message that was left. I didn't cut this person off. A couple things about that. When they kind of put a quote out, you know, for that, I, those who have eyes and ears, basically accusing me of not paying attention and not listening. And that's fine. You can make that accusation all you want. But then I would also come back with a scripture quote and say, you know, those who judge, <laughs> be aware because the judgment will be made on you. You see, kind of using a religious fervor to attack someone else isn't helpful. It's just not helpful. And if I was the pastor, I would sit this person down and I would kind of ask them to check his or her pride. Because what they want to do is they want to hold on to a belief and they want to make sure that others agree with them. And if not, then that other person is wrong. And if you keep going in that direction, they're not only wrong, they're bad. This happens on both sides of the politicized aisle in the Catholic Church. And let's not kid ourselves. There's definitely a division and it's somewhat political. And we can do this to each other all day long. And then this person recommend that I just sit in silence because I put out a video that was like 40 minutes long. Do they know my life? Do, do they actually know that I actually do pray in silence? Uh, it, it does, I mean, does this not seem a little judgy to you all? I mean, it, it does seem a little judgy because then they're gonna say, well, you just judged Father Foster. No, I didn't. Again, Father Foster, I don't know him personally. He comes across as a very holy and humble man. And so the questions that I ask are about the idea of private revelations and obedience that he promised to the bishop and his successors. This is key. And then there has to be always a, an attack on the work that I do. You know, instead of doing your little silly food trucks and you're just traveling around gallivanting, that's kind of the intention. And you can see that even in this kind of statement, as sweet and kind as this person is, and we didn't include their name, obviously, because we don't want to, we don't want to, I don't want to gaslight anybody, as some people have accused me of Mission Divine Mercy, is that, I don't know if you heard it, but there is definitely this tinge of judgment and, and arrogance and pride, and they, they don't actually know what I'm doing is giving people a second chance and giving people who need a helping hand and also creating a sense of, of connection from the Eucharist and making sure that the domestic church is celebrating a Eucharistic spirituality in their own homes. So it almost feels like when people want to attack, I have to defend myself. And guess what? I, I don't because it's going to be up to God to judge all of that. And that's kind of where I want to end is in my comments is that I, I really do appreciate all of your comments. I really sincerely do. And it felt when I was reading these comments that people really weren't listening. You know, some say, I watched it and I listen and I'm now just confused. I'm, I'm more confused now. You shouldn't be because, you know, at the heart of Mission Divine Mercy is beg for God's mercy. We are sinning. Our church has sinners in it. The smoke of Satan has entered our church. We need to do reparation. We need to go to confession. We need to celebrate the sacraments. We need to pray for each other. We need to pray for ourselves. We need to actually prove that we are faithful by doing charitable works, the corporal and the spiritual works of mercy. Guess what? I said in, a, in, a, in essence, what the Mission Divine Mercy messages are trying to encourage people to, to do. The big difference is I didn't need a private revelation to do it because I have the scriptures and my faith in Jesus Christ that, by the way, came from the Catholic Church 
popes and bishops to whom I as a Catholic priest vow obedience. And that is all of our call. As we bring this to a close, please know that Jesus will show obedience at the Garden of Gethsemane. And I am certainly praying that there will be peaceful resolutions between the Mission Divine Mercy, as well as the Bishop of San Antonio, as well as the Catholic Church around the world, that we will listen to God who speaks to us perfectly, clearly, and completely in the divine revelation that we call the scriptures, as well as in our traditions that have been given to us through the authority of the magisterium. Thank you for listening. I certainly hope not to convince you, but this continues to clarify what we're talking about. What does it mean to be Catholic, to be a Catholic priest? Well, guess what? Obedience is one of those vows. And as far as private revelation is concerned, as beautiful as they can be, it can cause confusion if people don't know how to receive it, which is why it's not required, because we have the perfect revelation in our scriptures, in our tradition, that has been given to us through the magisterium. Please make sure you let family and friends know about our show. Thank you for listening. Please leave your comments. Let us know what your thoughts are. And if there are other ideas that you would like for me to kind of have an episode on, I'm happy to do that. And again, if you can support us on Patreon, because again, you can't do stuff like this without paying professionals to do it. I just, I can't do everything. I need a team of people and they kind of need to get paid. And that's why the Patreon community provides not only support to us, but it also gives great um tools and a lot of content about what it means to be formed in the authentic teachings of the Catholic Church, as well as some really cool perks. So in the meantime, thank you. God bless you. May your Holy Week Triduum celebrations be one that brings you closer to God, deeper conversion, brings you closer to the sacraments and closer to the church and one another. God bless you and stay hungry for God.